Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for tuning in to the webinar by the Statistics Emission Reduction Partnership for Electric Power System. Today, we're excited to present you this webinar focused on SF6 gas storage inventories. My name is Volya Voshanka, and I manage the partnership at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Before we get started, I will go over a couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is recorded and will be posted on the website for future viewing. All participant lines will be muted during the webinar. However, you may submit questions using the Q&A box during the presentation. We will hold a Q&A session at the end of the webinar unless there are clarifying questions that the speakers can address immediately after the presentation. We will compile your questions as they come in and we'll do our best to cover them. If we do not answer your question, please feel free to reach out to the partnership by email that you see here on the screen, and we'll do our best to respond. Similarly, if you have any technical issues, please type them into Q&A box, and we'll do our best to address them. There is also a call-in number for the, for the audio um, if your sound quality through the computer is not great, um, and we'll be able to assist you um, with calling in as well. You just have to... Um, scroll down the audio information to see the calling number. A couple of words about the partnership. It was formed in 1999 between EPA and 48 charter partnership partners from the electric power industry um, who decided to work collaboratively to find cost-effective ways to reduce emissions of SF6. Currently, the partnership totals 90 partner utilities um, that represent approximately 50% of total U.S. grid transmission miles. In 2017, the total nameplate capacity of partners reached close to 11 million pounds of SF6. As a reminder, SF6 is a man-made gas that is emitted primarily from electrical transmission and distribution equipment, manufacture of electronics and semiconductors, and production of magnesium. SF6 stays in the atmosphere for about 3,200 years and has one of the highest global warming potentials. It is over 23,000 times more potent than CO2 over a 100-year time scale. Over the last 20 years, the partnership has been working to voluntarily reduce emissions of SF6 and disseminate best practices in doing so. Collectively, partners helped achieve a 75% reduction in SF6 emissions and an 86 decrease in emission rates among partners compared to the 99 baseline. So in absolute terms, partners have collectively reported a cumulative reduction of over 7.2 million pounds of SF6 in that time period, which is a um, substantial improvement from when the industry was in 1999. However, according to the data that we get from NOAA, global mean atmospheric concentration of SF6 continues to go up and at a slightly higher rate in recent years, and thus our efforts continue to be relevant. In recent years, the partnership has been focusing on delivering technical products to the industry, such as um, a report on best practices in reducing emissions of SF6 from electric power systems. And in the last few months, uh, we also released a corresponding poster that summarizes the longer report. Um, these tools are available online they were on our own VA website. Um, and they were developed with the help of industry partners who shared the best practices and tried solutions to reduce losses of SF6 as a valuable commodity, while also avoiding emissions of SF6 as a potent greenhouse gas. On updating technical information and soon plan to release a case study on alternatives to SF6 equipment. We hope to deliver more webinars to you in the near future and ask you to provide feedback on the topics of interest. Finally, we'll also evaluate the opportunities to host a co-host a partnership event in 2020. Coming back to today's agenda, um, one, one partner could not be here today, but we have two wonderful presentations um, for you focused on examples of in-house tools and strategies that utilities um, have developed to better track the SF6 inventory. The first speaker is Kiyomi Morris from Seattle City Light. Kiyomi ma manages Seattle City Light's SF6 inventory reporting and emission reduction program. 
serving as, a pro as the program's lead. She works with management and field staff to promote accurate and efficient emission resolution, as well as SF6 inventory and EPA reporting practices. Her presentation will focus on Seattle City Lights SF6 cylinder management improvement. And our next presentation will be by Carol Leiter and Michelle Coletti from Bonville Power Administration, BPA. Carol has worked at BPA for 28 years. She manages BPA's pollution prevention and abatement program and project. For the last five years, she created the annual SF6 emission reports for the BPA Voluntary Partnership. And Michelle is a physical scientist in Bonneville Power, um, having joined the Pollution Prevention and Abatement Program about three years ago. Uh, prior to BP, Michelle worked in the Office of Pesticides at the Environmental Protection Agency, performing an environmental risk assessment. Uh, Michelle also worked at the Environmental De Defense Fund, uh, Fund on the efforts to reduce methane emissions in the oil and gas sector. And Carol will be, de will be delivering BPA's presentation today. And now let's get started. Um, Kiyomi, please take it away. Hello, hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Uh, my name is Kiyomi Morse. I oversee the SF6 program at Cell City Light. Um, I'm here today to discuss some cylinder management strategies that we've implemented in our program uh, and highlight some of their outcomes. Uh, but more importantly, I'm here to highlight what you could implement um, and why you might find them effective for your programs too. So. With that, I'll jump right into things. Um, to start things off, I'll tell you a little bit about City Light and discuss who we're required to report to. And then from there, I'll explain the way that we previously managed cylinders at the utility, why it wasn't working for us, and therefore why we decided to make some improvements. And then I'll go over our approach to making the improvements and ultimately their outcomes and effectiveness. And then finally, I'll highlight what you might want to consider implementing into your programs and go over some of our best management practices. So to start things off, for those unfamiliar with us, we're a publicly owned or customer owned utility. We service the greater and growing Seattle area. Uh, and being in the Pacific Northwest, we have an abundance of natural resources. And similar to other utilities in our region, City Light owns and operates uh, several dams. Having access to these renewable resources means we can generate low carbon energy. Um, and it's important to our customer owners that we provide them not just with low carbon energy, but with carbon neutral energy. Um, that's also a requirement by the City of Seattle of City Light. Um, so to explain it on a very basic level, we inventory our emissions produced from our business, get it third party verified, and then purchase offsets to account for them. And it's allowed us to remain carbon neutral since uh, 2005. Uh, SF6 is, of course, included in that inventory of emiss emissions associated with our business. Um, and the neutrality aspect is incredibly important to note as I move into discussing uh, the entities that we report our SF6 inventory and emissions to. So who requires reporting? Um, there are three entities that we could be responsible to report SF6 emissions to. Um, they come from different levels, either federal, state, or local. Uh, the challenging part is that they all have different reporting thresholds and applicability. And I'll mention here that we only report to two. We're not required to report um, at a state level because we don't meet their emission thresholds. Um, however, we are required to report both at a federal level and a local level. Uh, federal because we exceed the nameplate capacity threshold, uh, and local level because we must um, uh, uphold our carbon neutrality. I mentioned that in the previous slide. Um, it is a requirement by the City of Seattle. Um, I also mentioned that the third-party verification goes along with it. Um, the verification helps us ensure that we're tracking our SF6 from cradle to grave. Um, so that cradle-to-grave documentation is incredibly important, both for proper SF6 reporting and for management purposes within the program. And I'm going to get into that, but I know for this presentation, just know for this presentation, I'll be focusing in uh, specifically on the management of cylinders. So how were we tracking cylinders? Similar to any other SF6 filled asset, we want to ensure it's tracked cradle-to-grave. Um, Previously, the typical scenario was that cylinders would get picked up by any personnel um, from any number of vendors. And they would then typically uh, take the cylinders directly to the facility that the cylinder would eventually get used at. Once on site, our personnel was responsible for naming the cylinder something unique, 
We did that because we found that uh, serial numbers were difficult to read, so a unique and easy identifier um, would, of course, get assigned. Um, in many cases, personnel were assigning a lot of names because many cylinders were getting purchased and then more and then more, and soon enough there would be a stockpile of cylinders at any of our facilities. Uh, this wasn't because crews themselves would be purchasing them, but just because cylinders were coming in from all over the place. They would come in with breakers, uh, get left over from projects, uh, and it wasn't uncommon for cylinders to get shared and moved around uh, between facilities. And stockpiling might seem great because you'll always have gas when you or others might need it, but um, because we manage this gas and want to track it closely, having a stockpile actually becomes a big responsibility. Regardless of how many cylinders were stationed on site, uh, we required personnel, specifically one designated person that we call our SF6 coordinators. Um, we designate them with the responsibility to weigh and report on the cylinders on site at their assigned facilities every month. Uh, they would do this by filling out a four-page report. Um, and that four-page report would then get reviewed by me. Uh, and they would continue filling out that report on a monthly basis um, until that cylinder then goes out for disposal. Um, now, if it's not already obvious the way the cylinders moved around the utility uh, and the amount that we reported on them made it incredibly difficult and time-consuming to track, and it just wasn't working for us for several reasons, and I'll get into that now. The challenge one, the first is, was just due to how they were coming in and out of the utility. Uh, City Light isn't as large as some of the other private or some public utilities, but we still have facilities all over the state, which means that there are gas suppliers all over the city and all over the state. Um, and yeah, I'll admit it'll, it's convenient for someone to go to a local vendor, pick up gas, bring it into whatever facility that needs it, and then return the gas to the vendor when they're finished. But if that information isn't getting tracked or conveyed to our SF6 coordinator, uh, then there's no way that that information is going to get documented. Uh, in addition to that, uh, vendors can charge a variety of prices for cylinders and gas, not to mention the fact that you have the option to rent or buy. And renting is a great option, uh, but in our case, uh, it's not always the best, especially if you keep cylinders on site and don't realize, the, realize that you're accumulating fees on rental bot bottles that you thought you owned. Um, and with more than one supplier, tracking that purchasing uh, comings and goings information becomes challenging, especially when you want to verify your purchase and sales logs at the end of the year. You have to be capable of tracking every vendor that you used in order to get a good confirmation. Um, and so that's inefficient and ineffective. Um, but the way that we were reporting our information was also troublesome for us, too. Which brings me to challenge number two. Um, we'd been tracking SF6 movement on spreadsheets, and it was set up in a way, um, it was a step up from the way that we were doing things, which used to be uh, paper pen mail-in submissions. <laughs> um, but whether it's paper or Excel, submissions were made each month, like I mentioned, from our coordinators. And they would report on cylinder weights and activity associated with their designated facilities. And the issue was we were just getting a lot of uh, individual spreadsheets. And on top of that, Excel was proving to be really confusing for people to fill out. Um, our SF6 coordinators would each fill it out in their own unique way, which is fine to do. Um, and part of the reason they would fill it out differently was because not everyone could connect with the terminology we were using. We were pulling it straight out of the regulation. <laughs> um, and people also weren't fans of the four-page report. They would really only use two of the pages. Uh, I'll stop here and mention that it, there's nothing wrong with using spreadsheets as long as people are using, uh, the people that are using it are comfortable and confident with using spreadsheets. And we realized we just didn't have things set up in the most efficient or effective way um, because people weren't using the spreadsheets in the way that they were meant to be used. Um, and the reality was everyone was overwhelmed with four-page reports reports. It wasn't uncommon for us in environmental to have to reach out to the SF6 coordinators because we couldn't understand what was getting reported to us. Uh, we were also starting to realize that there were cylinder name duplications 
inaccurate or inconsistent IDs on the cylinders because they moved around so much um, and people would rename them things. Uh, and it was a bit confusing and hard to identify markings on the bottles too, which didn't help. And our, like I said, our coordinators don't use Excel that often, so it, and the spreadsheets weren't locked. So it was just very troublesome. Um, from a tracking standpoint, uh, there was a lot of oversight. It became difficult to manage. Uh, thankfully, the nice thing was we had one point of contact for each facility, those SF6 coordinators, so we could always contact them with questions, but they were getting overwhelmed with the amount of questions they were getting from us each month. Um, and so it started to become apparent that people were getting overwhelmed on both sides. Um, and part of that, we realized, was due to the amount of cylinders that we had on site. Um, there were too many getting passed around, and our personnel were getting bogged down with having to weigh them every month. Um, and this, would, this became clear to me when I would go on site visits, ask the crews to verify their cylinder weights with me, and they would uh, give a big groan because they didn't want to have to pull out all of the bottles <laughs> and weigh them individually um, because it's very time consuming. Uh, so the bottom line was we knew we needed to make some improvements because we were spending just way too much time and money on these cylinders. Um, and our goals were pretty simple. We wanted to reduce the amount of uh, cylinder management and oversight that we had while increasing our tracking accuracy. Um, and in reducing cylinder oversight, that just really meant quantities and locations. Um, honestly, we were open to any idea. Any solution would have been better than where we were. Um, and so we started by researching effective strategies. We looked at notes and resources from past partnership conferences. We consulted both internal and external entities, such as uh, our SF6 coordinators, our warehousers, management, as well as other utilities and our vendors, too. And we picked out some strategies that we thought could be implemented. Um, and there were some, a few surprising, surprising things and some unsurprising things. Uh, the surprising piece was that our SF6 coordinators were actually okay with monthly reporting as long as they had a manageable inventory of cylinders and there was a more intuitive way to report that information. Um, something unsurprising and suggested by many was that we needed one SF6 vendor that could provide us with fast service, consistency, and a turnkey operation of cylinder purchasing and recycling. So in working with many groups, um, we established and executed some new procedures and then provided our crews with some training and resources on, on the changes that we made. So what did we do? So the first thing is that we now forecast uh, all of our SF6 activity and movement that's expected for the year. This helps us ensure that we have enough cylinders and gas available and on hand uh, to handle anticipated work. So we also identified uh, one sole vendor and set up a convenience contract with them to get cylinders and gas. And this provides us with uh, consistency in the product that we're purchasing, a competitive price on gas and cylinders, the ability to have quick turnaround times on orders, um, and it provides us with uh, all of our gas-related needs and services, such as gas recycling and gas cart management and maintenance. Uh, and this is preferable to our crews because their main concern is the convenience and ability to get gas. Uh, we also established one main facility for our cylinders to come through versus having multiple entry points. And by going through this facility, it's easy to corral our bottles, uh, get them identified with uh, a new unique tracking number um, that's standardized and easy to read on the bottle. Um, and then that can be linked back to the serial number. Um, and if we have issues identifying the serial number, it's Great that we have one gas vendor um, that's there to help us out and has been incredibly helpful, patient, and supportive throughout this entire process of making improvements. Um, by making it to the main entry facility, it's helpful in terms of ensuring the new cylinder gets tracked. Um, but really, as long as it's coming from one vendor, that's all that matters. If a cylinder gets missed and doesn't get an identifier, I can still reach out. Um, I can still catch that it came in um, because I can request a list of purchases and sales from our vendor, uh, and they're readily available to provide that to me. Um, 
And when a cylinder gets in our system, we then forecast um, what it's to be used for for the year. Um, forecasting is really important. We had our SF6 coordinators identify cylinders that weren't needed uh, and got rid of them. Um, so we reduced our inventory by about 56% and only kept cylinders needed in case of emergencies. We consolidated our resources and try to keep roughly one to two bottles at critical facilities that need them, um, which has reduced the amount of time that we spend every month weighing and tracking them. We also identified a new way to track our information. Instead of using Excel, we developed a tracking and reporting tool that's easy to use. Um, it's a database that our coordinators feed their monthly information into, so it's all automated. And um, there are incredibly useful tools out there. We chose to do it in-house. Uh, we're a public utility, and there are limitations on the type of software that we can use. Um, and also by doing it in-house, we were able to work with our coordinators to ensure the interface was easy and reporting was clear. We trained them on how to use it um, and had a trial period so they could give feedback on the system. Uh, the tool is also programmed to notify me of any additions uh, that they make so that I can immediately review it for potential errors. And it spits out an end of year report for me. I know that there are other softwares out there that also do this. Um, so it's really up to you and your utility um, to figure out what works best for you. But um, I can tell you that the time saved is incredible. 79% um, of previously submitted spreadsheets required some sort of adjustment, clarification, or a call to one of our reporters. Um, and roughly 30% of them contain true errors that actually needed fixing. But with the database, um, we're able to standardize things. And we're currently sitting at an error rate of about 0.03%. Um, and the end of year reporting, which used to take me over a week or more of my time to complete, I can now do within a couple hours, uh, including QAQC of that data. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, um, uh, recycling of SF6 through that same vendor. All SF6 leaves, again, through the one main facility, uh, and it has the same benefits that we saw with uh, purchasing. So before jumping into best management practices, um, I added a slide to quickly explain the tool. Uh, it's an access database. I know not everyone um, wants to use access, but um, that's just the way that we decided to do it. Uh, the way that it's designed is to ensure that we have real-time data available for us. Everything's standardized. It's clickbait interface for users. Um, also, the utility wants a future system that we can use to track and report all assets. Um, but until that day comes, uh, we'll use this. Uh, the nice thing is, is the queries are set up um, for a future system to integrate. Um, we have two softwares that we currently use. Um, and the way that the data is set up in our access is um, allows uh, our IT to integrate the data into our two existing systems that they'll eventually try to make into one. We'll see where things go on that. Um, but the queries can be used as a baseline. Um, and so what users do is they find their way to this reporting page where they click on a button that leads them to a form that they can use to report information. That information um, is usable for them. They can export information out of it, but it also um, uploads uh, information onto, um, into a way that I can use to report our EPA or greenhouse gas reports. Um, and this is kind of what they look like. You can see here that they have a variety of um, buttons that they can select that will lead them to a form. Um, they can use this side to select a date and then the facility and then it'll pop up a report that they can use to go out in the field and, and check nameplates against serial numbers. Um, and here's the page that I use to lead me to exportable Excel reports that I can use. So after showing you that, I'll jump into our best management practices. Um, quite honestly, the partnership has hit it on the nose with best management practices. Many of the strategies implemented came from the partnership. So I highly encourage um, I highly encourage people to use the resources and connections that um, other with other utilities to build strategies that work for your unique situation. No utility does it the same way, um, and no one gets it right the first time. 
uh, but it's good to have an idea of what strategies are being used. Overall, I would suggest minimizing and consolidating the number of SF6 sources you have. So get rid of any excess SF6 lying around that you can get rid of um, and identify one sole vendor that you can use um, that can provide you with the services you need. Uh, streamline the movement of gas so you have increased confidence in the fact that you're tracking everything. Use personalized real-time tracking applications or databases. Um, it not only helps for end of year reporting, but I can pull back in tables and run any sort of analysis I need. Um, from there, maintain and audit your inventory and tools. I enjoy going on site because I get that face-to-face -face interaction with our field personnel, um, which is important and in the next uh, best management practice, which is high, engage and um, engage with field personnel on management and safety. They have eyes on the ground that I don't have. Um, and by developing a good working relationship with them, they're more likely to come to me with their concerns, and we're more likely to find solutions together. Uh, and that collaboration is the biggest key here, both internal and, and external collaboration. Finally, uh, stay up to date on technology and management practices. This one's kind of a given. Uh, there's always something new out there. Even if you don't integrate it into your utility, it's just good to be aware of what's out there. Um, and in closing, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been involved in this process of making improvements. We're not quite finished yet um, of making all of the improvements that we want to make. Um, and it's not easy. Like I said, you won't always get it right the first time. It requires a lot of patience, collaboration, communication and humility, and it really does take a village. Um, things can and will go awry, uh, but by sticking with it and working together, it'll prove to be beneficial in the end. So with that, I will pass it. Um, actually, before I pass it over, I think um, I'm to take questions. Lola? Yep. Um, thank you, Kim, for sharing Seattle City Light's perspective. We do have one clarifying question. Question for you. Um, how are cylinders stacked with a unique number? Yeah, so previously um, we had been doing it uh, with a, um, a piece of paper that would hang down from the neck of the bottle. Um, when they come in, it can be either be done with a permanent marker um, or get stickered when they come into our um, warehouse. Uh, when we went to change the way that we did things. We had an inventory of cylinders that were already out at our facilities, but we needed to rename them to match the new unique tracking ID. Um, so a lot of the crews uh, went out and used a permanent pen, um, which has been working so far. Um, but when they get into our one main facility, they'll be tracked with a sticker. Uh, does the nameplate data exist in both the access database and the substation equipment maintenance management? Um, is the nameplate data? Um, it, the nameplate data is in the access database. Um, and gosh, I'm not quite sure what the second portion of that question is referring to. But yeah, we, we have all of the nameplate data for all of our equipment. Um, and what we ended up having to go out and re-verify that information because serial numbers would get transposed incorrectly. It was just um, human nature, human error. Um, and so what we ended up doing was taking photos of the nameplates. Some of them have um, the nameplates are reflective, so taking a photo was um, kind of difficult. Um, I know there are utilities out there that have um, different standards on the way that they um, order their nameplates so that they aren't as reflective, uh, but we did go out and re-verify everything before importing them into the access database. Um, why the cylinder weighing monthly instead of just end of year? Um, cylinders can get moved around everywhere. Uh, we, we found that weighing them monthly helped us keep an eye on where things were going. Um, annually, uh, if a cylinder was in point A, and ended up in point B by the end of the year um, with less S of six inside, it would take me a lot more time to go back at the end of the year, talk to everyone who's touched that bottle, and collect all of that information. Um, and by the time at the end of the year that I go back to that person and ask them, hey, what did you, um, 
where did this SF6 go, the likelihood of them remembering details and crucial information that I need uh, is uh, slim by the end of the year. If it's five months later, two months later, um, yeah, so we ended up doing monthly because it was just a much easier way for us to track the comings and goings of gas and making sure we were on top of where the SF6 was. Um, how many Great, thank you. And inventory? we have one more question. How many cylinders are in your inventory? Perfect. Um, how many cylinders in the inventory? We have roughly, we actually only have 50 now, um, which is great. Uh, it's, it's way easier to manage. Uh, we don't keep them at one facility. We, we keep them um, at our critical locations that need a bottle, but they only have one or two. Um, of course, they can share. We try to keep them from sharing and tell them just order through the vendor. Um, but, yeah, we have roughly 50 right now. Okay. Thank you so much, Kiyomi. And now we'll hand it over to Carol from Bonville Power Authority. Carol? Well, uh, Neha, thank you for giving us the opportunity to do this presentation. And Kiyomi, I just want to say again how impressed Michelle and I are, are with the system you put together. And you've got us thinking about ways that we may be able to automate some of our data entry. Keep your fingers crossed for us. Just a little background. BPA is a federally owned utility. We cover a five-state area, and we provide wholesale power, about 30% of the electrical power that's generated in the Pacific Northwest. One substations and over 1,800 pieces of SF6-containing equipment. You can see on this slide that the vast majority of the SF6 is in breakers. We do have quite a bit in three GIS substations. This slide shows a master spreadsheet uh, in our system. We have an uh, Excel worksheet that was developed in-house that we use to track this. And Michelle and I are going to talk about three uh, with that top red arrow that is all the gas coming into BPA and the uh, sources of data for that. And then Michelle will talk about the sources of data for the gas going out. We have gas inventory in the warehouses. Also our sub-maintenance crews have inventories and our construction crews. So the new gas coming in is the gas received from vendors. I've got a picture of the bottles in our warehouse inventory, and we typically have about 200 bottles in there. The first notice that Michelle and I get of gas coming in is from our warehouse. They tell us that they have received uh, gas, and they send us an Excel spreadsheet of the bottle that have come in. And this, you can see this has pallet number, the date it was weighed, serial number, and then the gas amount is calculated. Once the gas has been tested, and if it passes the spec, then our warehouse weighs it and enters it in their inventory. And this spreadsheet shows the gas in our inventory. We can, if we want, get a purchase history from our vendor. And this spreadsheet is what they send us. We don't always do this, but if we're having trouble reconciling purchases or reclaimed shipments, this can be very helpful. Now I'm going to talk about how we adjust 
our warehouse inventory and the inventory that we show in our master spreadsheet. We have a material request system that our crews use to request, request gas be sent to a substation or to their crew. And you can see on the screenshot of our material request that it, for top red box shows the site it's being delivered to, and the bottom red box shows how much. And right next to that shows the catalog ID, and that's how Michelle and I look it up in the material request system, and it also tells us whether it's a 115-pound cylinder or 25-pound. This sheet also shows who requested it so that if we have any questions, we can call that person. The warehouse and their inventory tracking also shows the gas that they have shipped out, and it gives the material request number and the date and weight. So we can cross-check these things. This is a picture of the report that our crews submit every month, and it is the main source of data for our SF6 emissions and uh, tracking. The bottom, the arrow down there shows the inventory that this crew has of good and usable gas. The, this slide shows Michelle and my master list of the, all the gas cylinders in the system by crew and the amount in the warehouse. Now I'm going to turn it over to Michelle to talk about the gas cylinders that go out of our system. Oh, thank you, Carol. So what I'll be talking about is how we receive uh, those bottles of SF6 back from our field locations, from our sub-maintenance crews and construction crews, uh, how they come back to the warehouse, and then the warehouse returns them to the vendor. Uh, we refer to our used gas as reclaim, because when we send uh, the gas back, it's uh, returned to the vendor to be recycled if they can recycle it. So returning to that uh, spreadsheet that's used by our crews, uh, you can see this pink box with the arrow pointing. That's uh, the uh, material that's staged for return to the warehouse. So they fill out a transportation request, which is similar to the material request, um, uh, and then it's sent to the warehouse. And then the warehouse, when they receive it, they weigh it. Uh, they, it's weighed on both sides, but we tend to use the warehouse scale because it's consistent across uh, the data. So we receive an email from the warehouse saying that they've received um, gas from the field. And the first column is the location and then the date. And then the last column, the one that begins with a six, that's the transportation request number. So we're able to look up those shipments by that. Um, this is what the transportation request form looks like that the field crews fill out to send it back. And it's similar to the MR in the sense that we can look up where it came from, how much gas was shipped, and the date. Um, so that's three ways of verifying material is shipped from the field to the warehouse. We internally track these uh, documents so that we can verify we have them. So all of these are emails that we save in our end-of-year file to, to show where the gas came from, what the uh, transportation request number is, and how many pounds of gas were in that shipment. And that's just so we can double and triple check that we have all of the gas accounted for. The warehouse also keeps a spreadsheet similar to the way they track, have an internal spreadsheet of material requests. They keep an internal spreadsheet of transportation requests. So this is another way for us to ensure that the warehouse has the same information and we have the same information. list. And the um, monthly report that we showed earlier is the list for each individual crew. So now that we've received information, uh, we've received the bottles back from the field to the warehouse, 
this is uh, how we know that the warehouse is then shipping used bottles to the vendor. Um, so they send us a notice with a file of all of the bottles that they're sending to our vendor. And we save that email for our tracking purposes as well. This is the spreadsheet of bottles that are sent to the vendor. You can see it's got the location, the bottle number, and again, the TR number, so we can always have a way of internally verifying. And I'm going to turn it back over to Carol to discuss um, how all of these different things come together to show our uh, full inventory. I think that this spreadsheet does a great job of showing the simplicity of the mass balance of what, what comes in and what goes out, but it also shows how complicated and how many pieces of information and people are involved in getting that number. This warehouse, this is a spreadsheet that's in the Excel database that Michelle and I populate and use. And you can see we have a field where we list, this is the blue line on the top, what is sent from the warehouse out to the field. The next line shows vendor purchases. The green line is the reclaim that BPA sends back to the vendor. And the bottom line lists all the used gas and any good gas that comes back from the field to the warehouse inventory. Michelle and I were, in putting this together, we're talking about lessons learned. And the first thing Michelle said is communication. It takes so many people putting in various pieces of information and cross-checking them and speaking to the operators and the crews to get good results. We also, our system has, as I hope we've demonstrated, lots of cross-checking. For example, the warehouse inventory, we verify monthly with a visual count. We use some material request system to track the cylinders. The field crews come in and we compare that to the warehouse inventory of cylinder sent in and to the monthly report that the crews show. So once they have sent it in, their line for reclaim should be blank. We use transportation requests to track the cylinders. Oh, I'm sorry, that first one, the material requests are what we send out to the crews. And the transportation requests we use to track what comes into the crew. So our lessons learned, built-in redundancy, and group effort. Thank you again for giving us the opportunity to present. If you have any questions or you're putting a system together, Michelle and I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Great. Thank you so much, Carol and Michelle. Um, I'm just waiting to see if there's any clarifying questions. And as we do have one that just came in. Um, what oh, Molly. Of time we, is spent on ethics I'm, tracking? We are yeah. so envious of Kiyomi's two-hour report development. We spend a lot of time on it, typically three days a month for the monthly data entry. And then, I don't know, Michelle, a week in putting together the final report, and we do a lot of verification on that last report before we send it off to EPA. Time. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I do not see any more clarifying questions, so we're just going to move on to the general Q&A session. Um, we do have a couple of questions that were coming in during the presentation. Um, I see some that are being typed in right now. And um, they wanted you to go back to the last slide and um, explain what it read. 
was it the our, our contact information or the lessons learned? This one. building redundancy. It, it's this one. Lessons learned. So the, and this is just sort of really clarifying what the most important parts of our tracking system are, and that's the redundancy, our ability to, to track, you know, from the crews directly with their spreadsheets, from our, our shipping, internal shipping system, from receiving with the warehouse, working with the vendors. We have so many redundant ways to look up information so that we can really verify where everything is. And then, of course, the group effort. We, we really couldn't do this tracking. We, I mean, BPA is a huge system. We're in six states, five states. Five states. We, we report to, uh, federally, we report to three states. Um, no local reporting requirements yet, uh, but we just have a, a really large system and a lot of moving parts. So if we didn't have communication with our crews and with the warehouse and with our purchasing entity, we would be you know, in, in some trouble. So it's a, it really is a group effort. Great, thank you. I think that answers the next session. We have a first question for Kiyomi. Do you have records on the cylinder um, being moved between facilities, or is it tracked through your monthly cylinder weigh-in? So anytime um, an asset moves between facilities, that information gets reported into the database um, on top of the end of the month cylinder weigh in. Hope that answers your question. Yep, thank you very much. And a question for both. How do you handle equipment containing SF6 coming back from the field? I don't know if BPA, you want to take it first or you want me to take it first? <laughs> um, SF6 equipment coming back from the field. If you're talking about changes in nameplate or cylinders of gas that have been removed from equipment, they are the cruise list, the gas, the cylinders they have for reclaim on their monthly report. The warehouse keeps a list of cylinders that comes in and weighs them. I hope that answered that question. We do not ship equipment back with SF6 in it. It's put into cylinders. And then to follow up on that, we do things similar to BPA um, where the amount of SF6 coming out is getting tracked uh, in the cylinders. Um, and then weighing the cylinders allows us to figure out how much came out of it. Um, of course, there are nameplate issues that everyone seems to have. Um, and you're not alone there. City Light um, is in the same position. Thank you. And we have another question for I, both speakers. Well, I was going to add okay, that, that nameplate issue that Kiyomi mentioned. When we, our reports, our monthly report from our crews, when they put gas in, they do not put on their monthly report the amount that they actually put in. They put the nameplate. But when they take out gas, when they retire equipment, they do report the actual amount that they took out. So there is an inconsistency there. Okay. Wonderful. The next question uh, for both of you. Do you track um, where the SF6 gas is installed when moved from cylinder to breaker? Um, yeah. Yeah, did you want to take go that ahead. first, Carol? No, you go ahead. Okay, um, yeah, so we in the database, um, the way it gets reported is the coordinator will identify the equipment to be commissioned, how much gas was added from what cylinder, and then they report that information to us with any notes that they have on um, on the what happened throughout the process. We, the if you look back at the slide that shows the monthly reports, our crews put in the equipment ID and the dispatch ID, which is the electrical location of the equipment that they are either putting gas into or taking gas out of. And we have other reports that we look at that 
we have the equipment manuals that we look up nameplate in. We can call the substation operator sometimes if we need some clarification. And then there is our system of record, our, our asset inventory that shows nameplate of all equipment and installation dates. Yeah, I just want to mention that uh, so our presentation covered our gas storage and inventory system, but the other massive part of our tracking operation is the nameplate, new equipment installed, uh, retired equipment, and that involves our internal crews pulling gas from the warehouse, using the gas, returning the bottles to the warehouse, and then also a, a, a small portion of that is uh, CMO, contract operations, where we have a system for managing when contractors do that for us. Uh, we also track um, leaks in a log, so whenever our crews have to put gas into equipment, they track how much they put in uh, on a leak log that we report annually. So that way we know where our, our leaks are. And we know if, when we calculate our emission, we know what portion of that was put into leaky equipment. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how do you track disposition of the fixed gas at the end of life for both of you? We send all of ours for reclaim, and then we get our cylinders back full of uh, new gas. Uh, the way that we do it is that we have our crew send it to our salvage unit, um, who then sends it off to our SS6 recycler. And then the cylinders um, will sometimes get um, disposed of, uh, or we'll give them to the vendor, or um, uh, we can also, we have the option to request those cylinders to come back full of gas or empty. <laughs> All right, the next question, um, does either Seattle City Light or BPA order SF6 with equipment, or do you order the gas separate for the new equipment? You want to go first, Kiyomi? Sure. Yeah, actually, the SF6 coming in with equipment, um, that wasn't uh, fun tracking-wise. Uh, we actually have been working um, diligently to eliminate manufacturers from sending um, extra bottles with the breakers that we were purchasing. We refer to them as pony bottles because they just come along with them. Um, and we just only want to purchase our SF6 from that one vendor to keep things standardized. Um, and like I said, to make sure that we're only getting our, we only have one person to verify purchasing and recycling records with. BPA orders the equipment and then the crews request gas from our inventory to go into it. We, equipment that's less than 500 kV comes in with a low pressure blanket of SF6. So we do calculate the blanket as part of our inventory of gas. And then when the blanket is taken off, when the equipment is installed, that is reflected in the crew's bottles of gas staged for reclaim to the warehouse. When we have equipment put in by vendors, not BPA crews, we require that they supply their own gas and they take any gas with them. So any equipment that's put in by vendor, we do not uh, take that gas, the only part of that gas that enters our system is the nameplate value. question that is asking about differences between the equipment nameplate data indicating the number of pounds of SF6. The equipment is stated um, to hold by the equipment manufacturers and the actual number of pounds put into put into each piece of equipment. Oh well, yeah, it EPA never matches. <laughs> yeah, and, and it doesn't matter because EPA requires that we use nameplate. That is correct. Yeah, we when when our uh, crews go to commission uh, equipment, um, we already have the nameplate data in our uh, database uh, because the equipment gets tracked as a spare. Uh, we track the pounds um, that are inside, and then as well as the nameplate. And then when it goes to become commissioned, um, we track how much came out of the bottles and was put into 
um, said piece of equipment. Um, but yeah, we, we have to report the nameplate capacity. It's just good on our end to also know how much actually came out of the cylinders and uh, was added to it. So that we know what to expect um, much later when we go to retire it. And what is the process to know the exact weight of gas? Weight of gas? We use a calibrated scale, and I believe the legal requirement is it to be calibrated per manufacturer's instructions, so ours are calibrated annually. We also use a calibrated scale, um, similar to Carol. Um, the regulations say um, per manufacturer specifications. Um, but the way we, we weigh the cylinders themselves is we have the crew remove the cap because uh, the cap adds additional weight. Um, and then they'll weigh the bottle, subtract the tear, um, and that's the supposed amount of FF6 inside the cylinder. If you went back and looked at any of our warehouse spreadsheets or the crew inventories, they put in the total weight and the, they've got a cap weight there. And then the amount of gas in the cylinder is just a simple arithmetic calculation in those spreadsheets. So they can choose whether or not that, that they put that cap weight on. If they've weighed it without the cap, they take that off. If they weigh, weigh it with the cap, they put it on. The next question we have um, is more of a, I guess, a general question. Uh, do you see a value from an environmental perspective in using reconditioned SF6 gas versus virgin SF6 gas? Uh, this is Carol from VPA. As long as the gas meets our spec, we use it. So I just, without knowing a whole lot about it, I like that we use reclaimed gas. And just to add on to that, Carol, um, yeah, I, I would like to see our crews um, getting more use out of the gas carts um, and using them themselves so that we can um, pull gas out of a breaker that's retiring, um, clean the gas, and put it into a new one um, if it meets our specs. Um, but yeah, it's really up to um, the crews and how comfortable they are with it. Jimmy, I want to be clear that we send our gas back to the vendor to be reclaimed. We use the carts to pull the old gas out, but we don't use them to reclaim anything. We do use them to test quality. Yes, yeah. We um, normally, we also send them to the vendor, the, um, the bottles full of reclaimed gas. Um, but it would, be, it would be awesome if our, our crews uh, were utilizing the gas carts. To their full potential. Okay, thank you. And the next question, when you send gas for reclamation, um, you wait, but do you get reports from the reclamation company? And if you do, what sort of percentage variation do you see between what you have weighed and what reclamation vendor shows? BPA gets very little variation. Yeah, same same here. It's usually like maybe a point point uh, one or point two um, of a difference. And a follow up question: Has there been any discussion of having equipment um, shipped with dry air rather than a six? Um, well, our, our our five hundred kV equipment comes with a nitrogen blanket and the lower voltages are shipped with a low pressure SF6 blanket. So I guess the answer is no. We have not talked about having them shipped with dry air. We have not. Um, we haven't had that discussion either. Normally it gets sent with um, um, SF6. Some of them come in with nitrogen, but um, mainly SF6.
the databases you use to track um, uh, the, the ones that you build yourselves or purchase? And I think you've answered it in your, quest in your question, but I'll, I'll let you elaborate on that a little bit more. Yeah, we ended up um, building it out. Um, like I said, we, we did look at some other um, application or tools that could be used, um, but our limitation um, came from our um, IT standards um, and having breaker information in the software that we were going to be using. Um, to be able to fully track SF6, uh, we needed to have both the cylinders and the breakers, the serial numbers, the locations of the equipment in the database. Um, and for that reason, uh, we couldn't uh, uh, have an, uh, we, we had to do an in-house system um, and build it out ourselves. Uh, we, we have two um, asset management systems that we also use. And I would mentioned um, that the access database that was built um, was built in a way so that the back end could, um, the, the tables could feed into those two systems. Um, I think the dream here is that we'll only have one system in the future, but um, until then we'll, we'll, um, we'll have to use three tracking systems. Um, but for SF6, it's only the database, and it feeds those other two. BPA's Excel workbook was developed in-house. Part of that was because when it was developed in 1999, there was no software available. And we have similar issues with IT requirements that would not allow us to use purchase software. Thank you both. Um, and the last question would be that we're going to take today. Um, how do you account for the weight of the value of the cylinder, and is there verification on cylinder tear, uh, tie, um, tear weight accuracy? Uh, we, well, um, like I said, it was difficult for our um, crews to sometimes identify where the tear weight was just with all the stamps on the cylinders. Um, it would get kind of confusing. Um, so we, we do go with whatever is stamped on the cylinder um, and our gas vendor can also provide us with um, the tear weight that they have um, on the, the bottle that they had sent us. So um, yeah, we go, with, we go with what's stamped on the bottle. Um, and how do we account for the weight of the valve of the cylinder? Um, we do not. It, it should be in the tear. Uh, I second what Yomi said, that the valve weight is in the tear. And we do indirectly verify the tear weight because when bottles come in empty, they are weighed by our warehouse. And I think we have maybe in all these many years found just a few discrepancy and we discrepancies in the weight that we see for the bottle and the weight that's stamped on there and we just point it out to the vendor and they correct it. But it, it's a problem. Okay. Thank you so much both for um, agreeing to answer all those questions. Uh, we are aware there are a couple more questions and um, we will try to get back to you by email if you registered and provided your email address. Or feel free to email the partnership um, email that was at the beginning of the slide. It's sf6partnership at epa.gov. Um, and at this time, I would like to thank our volunteer speakers today for sharing their experiences. It is because of such active partners we're able to offer resources to the partnership. And thank you all for your attention and for your continued interest in efforts to reduce emissions of SF6 in this important sector. Thank you. Bye-bye.